Well, good morning, or whenever it is you're joining us, we're so glad that you're with us today. And I just want to encourage you, like I do every week, as we get ready to get into God's Word together, our worship team is going to come and lead us in worship. And I don't want you just to sit and watch it. I want you to participate, right? Worship is a participation sport. It's not a spectator sport. And I just want you to follow along. The words will be here on the screen. And as our worship team begins to lead us, then you make your home, your bedroom, your car, wherever you are, just a sanctuary of worship. And as you begin to sing these words to the Lord, you begin to open your heart. I believe the presence of God is going to come right into your life, into your situation, and it'll begin to encourage you and strengthen you. So don't just sit back and watch, but participate. And let's open our hearts to whatever he wants to speak to us today through his word, because we've got a great message for you today. So come on, let's open in prayer, and then we're going to go right into worship. Father, I thank you for each person that's joined us today. And Lord, you know the challenges that are in front of them. But I just pray that right now we would lay those things aside, and we make a decision that we're going to worship you. And Father, I pray that as we begin to open our mouth and praise you, your presence will come right into their situation and minister life to each one. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's worship the Lord together. I was there. Till I met you
day, man. It's just so good to worship the Lord, no matter what we're walking through. When you allow yourself to kind of push those things aside and begin to focus on Him, His presence comes and you feel the burden lift. He shows up on your behalf. And I just want to encourage you to be a worshiper. Be, make that part of your life. You know, some of us are, are really into reading God's word, but there's some of us that have to get to a place to where we learn to be worshipers. And when you do that, it creates an atmosphere to where the word of God can go down deep inside of you. So be a worshiper, all right? And a student of God's word. When you put those two worlds together, there's a dynamic that begins to happen that's so powerful. And I'm just excited about what God's gonna do in your life. So I wanna pray over you. And I know that some of you are facing some real challenges. And I don't want to ever make light of those situations that are coming down on you, right? Because that's your issue. And it might be huge. It might be an issue in your physical body. It could be a financial issue that you're walking through. Or maybe you're just under the weight of it and you're just having a hard time. I feel like you're losing your mind. I had one person say, Pastor, I don't know. I just feel like I'm losing my mind. Listen, the God of peace will show up on your behalf and begin to move in your situation if you'll open your heart and let him. Come on, let's pray together. Father, I thank you. Lord, for each person that's joined us today, you know the challenges that they're facing. Lord, they're so real. And I just pray that right now you would bring healing to physical bodies. Lord, I pray for the one who's gotten a diagnosis from a doctor in the last few weeks. And Lord, that diagnosis has struck fear in their heart. But Lord, I, I just want you to let them know that you're bigger than cancer. You're bigger than the coronavirus. You're bigger than any challenge they're facing. And Father, I'm just believing that healing is going to flow right now. Minister life to each one that's watching. Or those that are struggling in their mental health. They've just been so filled with anxiety. They don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. And Lord, they've been fearful. I pray that right now, you would let faith well up inside of them. Turn the situation around. Lift the burden. Lord, those that are struggling financially, meet every need in their life according to your riches and glory supernaturally. Be Jehovah Jireh to them. Lord, I thank you that we don't have to navigate the difficulties of this life alone. But Lord, your promise is that you'll be with us. Even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear because you're there. Minister life and hope to each person that's joining us. We give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, if we can help you in any way, don't hesitate to reach out. Contact us via email. A message here on Facebook, whatever you can do, or, or call the church. We have people that'll pray with you and stand with you, even if you live in another part of the world. We're in this thing together. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, all right? So I'm just believing God's gonna move supernaturally in your life. So glad that you're with us today. And if we can help you in other ways, different ministries that are taking place, men's ministry, Tuesday morning, 6 a.m., you can join us via Zoom. Ladies ministry will be having, starting a new Bible study in two weeks. So find out, go to our website, summitchristianchurch.org. Find out what's going on. Be a part of it. Celebrate Recovery meets here in person every Monday at 7 p.m. We're doing different ministries, youth, young adults, to try to help you in this journey of faith. So get plugged in. And if you're part of our online campus, then figure out how we can help you. And if we need to reach out to you, please don't hesitate to contact us, all right? We're just excited about what God's doing and what he's going to continue to do as we move into this new season. All right, I just want to remind you, uh, for those of you that have been faithful to help support financially, you understand everything takes money, right? We're not after your money. We just want to pay the bills. But if the Lord puts it on your heart to help us financially, then you do whatever he tells you to do. And if you want to know how to give, you can give several different ways. Go to our website. It's all there. You can give through PayPal, text to give, certainly mail us a check. But we just want you to know that, hey, anything you give is going to help us continue getting the message out as we move forward. And I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness, especially to our people that have been faithful with tithes and offering throughout this crazy pandemic. And we know that God has great ministry ahead for us. So if you can help us, great. We'd sure appreciate it. If not, we're just glad you're here. All right. Okay. If you're ready to get in the word this morning, I'm just excited about our speaker today. Our speaker is going to come and share with you. He's one of our own here in our church. He's been here for about four years. He's a student of God's word. Uh, he has a Bible knowledge that uh, very few people that I've come in contact with carry. And John's going to come. He's a gifted teacher. His name's John Newcomb, and he's going to share God's word. I want you to open your heart and listen with spiritual ears. And I know God's going to speak something to you today. All right. So welcome, John, as he comes. 
Good morning. I'm excited to share this message with you, uh, in part because the last time I spoke here, I was driving away from the church and was praying, and immediately the Lord gave me a scripture from Luke chapter 12 and said, I want you to teach on that next time. And I got to tell you, this last week in preparing this message, I've had a tremendous amount of uh, spiritual opposition to me. So I know that God is going to do something through this message. And uh, I want to open the scriptures to a couple of passages, Luke 12, and then also Psalm 112, easy to remember. So Luke 12, starting with uh, verse 4. This is Jesus speaking. He's not talking to the disciples per se. He's talking to the crowds, everybody. And he says this, and pay attention to how many times Jesus uses the word fear or afraid and in what context he uses these words. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after the killing of your body, has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him, but are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And then down in verse 32, he picks up this theme again and says, don't be afraid, little flock. Your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. And then turning back to Psalm 112, the psalmist writes this, Blessed are those who fear the Lord and find great delight in his commands. Verse 7, they have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast. They trust in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They have no fear. And then in Psalm 34, David says this, Come, my children, listen to me, and I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say right now America is in serious moral decline and in serious trouble morally. Um, someone once said America is like a bouquet of cut flowers. Still beautiful, but we've severed ourselves off from what made us so beautiful and unique. And I think that's true to an extent. We've come to a point where I think truth is the casualty of our time where when you speak the truth, you're, you're considered hateful at times. George Orwell is known for one of his sayings that in a time of deceit, speaking the truth is a revolutionary act, and that's where we, the church, are today. But I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist because of my faith, because I believe the mercy of the Lord is new every morning. Lester Summerall used to say, if you can't be an optimist, God can't be an optimist. And I believe God is an optimist. And God laughs at the wicked, and he tells us not to fret because of evil men who carry out their wicked schemes, because he is in charge. And so I'm an optimist because I believe there is still hope, and I believe the only hope for America is revival. Now, I'm not a historian by any means, but I am kind of a history buff, and a couple of years ago, I was, many years ago now, I was hired to work on a film project about church history. This was for this big event in Africa. And I had spent a little over a year working on this project. And I had the first thing I had to do was prepare the script. So I had to read everything about church history. And I thought I knew a lot about it, but you know, like anything, when you start to study it, you realize how ignorant you are about the subject. I think that's one of the problems with the Google age is that uh, because we have so much information at our fingertips, we think we know everything, when in fact we know nothing. And so our, our knowledge becomes a mile wide, but an inch deep. But as I began to study this, and I, and I had to deal, talk with uh, professors and seminary people and ministers across the denominations and uh, emails and phone calls and interviews and so forth, and then all these books. I've got bins of these books in my crawl space still. And one of the things, I, and I'd love to tell you that church history was a wonderful, you know, glorious story. It was not. It is dismal, and it is shocking what, how bad the church got at different points in its history. I mean, it got to the point where at one point the church made it the death penalty to read the Bible in your own language. And long before the Reformation, there were reformers in every generation. In every generation, there were people who cried out for reform. I think what made the, the Protestant Reformation stick was the advent of the printing press and so forth. But 
One thing I've noticed about church history is that it survived by revival. The Holy Spirit seemed to come down and revive the church at different points. It's interesting. There was one, at one point in the uh, Middle Ages, there was a guy who, who came to the faith in spite of the corruption of the church, and his friend was asking him how that happened. And he said, well, I realized that the corruption of Christianity, far from discrediting it, is actually proof of its authenticity, because if this were of human origin, it would never survive. But you can see the unseen hand. And it's true. In every generation, you see the unseen hand turning over the tables of the money changers and cleansing the temple. So revival is really the story of Christianity from the day of Pentecost onward. Because remember, that first group of people who got saved, the 3,000, they're the ones who were shouting crucify. Because Peter said, you're the ones who handed him over. And I think that American history is also a history of revival. You can look at it from a natural point of view or a supernatural point of view. And really, even Ben Franklin, who was the least religious of the founding fathers and was the only one, by the way, who ever called himself a deist, and he said he was only a deist in his youth, he was considered that way because he never committed to any one denomination. But he said the American Revolution never would have happened had it not been for the Great Awakening. And he was part of that. He, was, he attended George Whitfield's evangelistic meetings. He printed his sermons in his newspaper. He became friends with them, actually. The Great Awakening took place in the 1730s and then spread for the next several decades under Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. And it was what united the country. That word united, and it's in the United States, comes from the Great Awakening. These colonies were all sort of factions that kept to themselves, but the awakening lowered those denominational barriers and united them. It also caused them to want freedom. It also caused them to want equality for others. And so all of that led to the United States. And I don't think there would have been a civil war had it not been for the second Great Awakening, which was even bigger than the first Great Awakening. That took place, started in the 1820s, starting, I think, in Kentucky and Tennessee and then spreading to New York. Charles Finney was part of that. And they, the emphasis there was social reform. Then you've got the Azusa Street Revival here in Los Angeles that uh, put the emphasis on the need for the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's the largest manifestation of Christianity in the world today is the Pentecostal charismatic movement outside of the Catholic Church. But in all of those revivals, in church history and in American history, there's one thing that they all, they all have a different emphasis, but there's one common denominator with all of them, and that is that the church returns to the fear of God. And the fear of God, I think, is a very misunderstood and little noted concept in much of our teaching today, and it's what Jesus is talking about here. And for those of us who've had either absent fathers or distant fathers or abusive fathers, angry fathers, uh, when you say the fear of God, you immediately react negatively to that, and you pull back. But I want to show you that the fear of God is the ultimate positive. It is not a negative. And there is something that I'll call the dread of God, which is a fear of God in a negative way. You can really see this with the Israelites. Moses feared the Lord. The Israelites dreaded the Lord. They did not fear God in the right way. Um, David feared the Lord. Saul dreaded the Lord. Jacob feared the Lord. Esau dreaded the Lord. And that's the difference. And so I think that I want to show you that the fear of the Lord is a beautiful thing. And here's how you can tell the difference between fearing the Lord and dreading the Lord. Fear of the Lord draws you toward him. Dread of the Lord pulls you away. Think of our, our ancestors, the first spiritual beings who sinned. What was the first thing they did? They felt shame. Then they felt fear. Then they hid or they lied. They, they tried to hide themselves from God. That's, that's the dread of God. That's the result of sin. But fear of the Lord is because of his forgiveness we draw toward him. And it is, it's an amazing thing. Look at the structure of the way Jesus presents this story this, this uh, commandment to us, to fear the Lord. Now, first of all, let's just take a quick look at the context, because context is always vital. He's speaking to the crowds, as I say, and he's telling them to be on their guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. Now, it's important to understand the Pharisees were not just the religious leaders. They were the leaders. They had the authority to arrest people and to try them and execute them. They would have, arrest, they would have executed Jesus, but they didn't want his blood on their hands. Um, so there, it's more than just religious leaders. And he's saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is, of course, 
something we all know that, you know, it's you say one thing and do another. And we see that all the time in our culture. We've got these, you know, environmentalists who will get on a private jet, fly all over the world, spewing out, you know, uh, carbons, and then telling others they can't use fossil fuels. Or you've got the rich actor, you know, uh, putting down the Second Amendment. They've got armed security and armed gates in another Malibu mansion. Or you've got the rich athlete making millions of dollars off of capitalism, but then espousing socialism for others. So we see hypocrisy all the time. We recognize it all the time. But he's saying, be on your guard against the yeast, which is, yeast is um, something that puffs up the dough, and it puffs up. It's the pride of yeast. But I'm really into word origins, and the word hypocrite comes from the Greek theater, and it's a compound word that quite literally means to project from beneath. And what it referred to was the masks that the actors in the amphitheater wore. They, they wanted, with an actor, you needed somebody who could project, you know, obviously they didn't have microphones, so you needed to be able to project to a huge crowd in an amphitheater, but they often wore masks, so you had to be able to project from beneath that mask. And so that's the term, project from beneath, became synonymous with an actor. But, but in uh, Jesus telling us to be on our guard against this, this is what we all do. We all wear masks of how we want people to perceive us and then we project out from beneath that. And you know, I think social media is that on steroids. So he starts this teaching on the fear of the Lord by warning us, be on your guard against this. And then he links the two by saying, there's nothing hidden that's, that's not going to be made known. So I think that's the first thing in understanding the fear of the Lord is that God knows everything and the Lord cares about everything. He knows everything. So the first thing he says is, don't be afraid of man. Fear of man is a snare, you know, Solomon said. I knew a, a woman who was lived uh, in a cabin in Alaska for a long time. She and her husband were trappers up there, and she was showing me all her bear skins and her wolf skins and all this stuff. And then she showed me this little uh, wire thing, and she said, that's a snare. That's how I caught a lot of these animals. And all it was, it was very simple, but it had a little mechanism on it that when the animal would step into it, it would try to immediately get itself free from it. And the, the more it would thrash, the tighter that snare became until it was fully caught. And Solomon says, the fear of man is a snare. The more we care about what other people think, the more it becomes a cyclical thing. It becomes a trap and we get out of it. And Jesus is saying, don't fear man. Don't be afraid of man. And then he says, fear God. Three times he says it. I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear him. And then after he says that, he, he repeats it. Yes, I tell you, fear him, as if, as if we didn't get it. He, he repeats it a third time. So he's, he's saying, don't be afraid of man. Fear God, fear God, fear God. But don't be afraid because God loves you. And again, don't be afraid because God is pleased to give you the kingdom. I was sharing some of this in our, our Bible study, and my friend Rich Dalma said, it's like a spiritual equation. Fear God plus fear God plus fear God equals no fear. And I thought, yes, that's excellent. Because that's really what the fear of the Lord is all about. It's about being fearless. That's why I read those other passages from the Psalms where in Psalm 12, it says, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. You have no fear of bad news. Your heart is steadfast. You have no fear. See, I think what God wants for us is to be bold as hell or bolder than hell, really. And I don't mean that swearing. I mean, as the forces of evil that are in this world, he wants us to be bold as hell and humble before him. He wants those two things. And that's really what we're supposed to be as Christians because Paul says we're seated with Christ right now in the heavenly realms, right now. So we are with Christ and Christ is with us. We've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness. We're now placed with Christ on the throne with him. So we have the, his full authority over the demonic forces. So we are to be bold in this. But we do that. We humble ourselves before the Lord and acknowledge him. So I, wa I want to talk about what is the fear of the Lord, what it isn't, why fear the Lord, why people don't fear the Lord, and how do we fear the Lord? Because when David says, come, my children, listen to me, I'll teach you the fear of the Lord, that means this is not something like being born again. When you're born again, you're born again. You've come into the faith, and you have that. It's sealed for you in heaven. It can't be taken away from you. But the fear of the Lord is something you learn. It's something you grow in. I think I fear the Lord more now than I did when I first came to the faith, and I hope I'll fear the Lord more in 10 years from now. So, what is the fear of the Lord? I think, well, obviously in this passage, he's talking about God as the judge, that he is the judge. The writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You see, it pleases God to bless us. 
But without faith, it's impossible to access that. So he says, and to come to God, you have to, one, believe that he exists. That is, that he holds all things together and that he knows everything. There isn't anything hidden from him. He's holding this together. He's holding everything together right now. And that he rewards those who diligently seek him. God is the judge. He is going to judge us. Paul says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Okay, so we're not condemned. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to be judged. In fact, Paul begins Romans by saying, everybody's going to come before the Lord and be judged for everything we've done. Jesus said, you're going to be judged for everything you've said. In Corinthians, Paul says, we're going to be judged for the secrets of our heart. And then in another place, he says, we're going to be judged for the motives, why we did what we did. This, this is a fact that we everything I do matters. Everything I think matters. Everything I say matters. So that is the first premise of the fear of the Lord. But I can live without fear, with boldness, knowing that I have been forgiven. This is why he says, the hairs of your head are numbered. Nobody cares about how many hairs they have on their head. Yet he's saying, in holding all things together, God knows everything about you. He cares about details you don't care about. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he cares about you. And he's pleased to give you the kingdom. The whole purpose, he created us out of love. So his whole purpose is to bring us into that kingdom. But he is the judge. Now, why should we fear the Lord? Well, I went through the Psalms just real quickly. This is by no means exhausting, but I just like I took a stone and skipped it across the waters, just, just the book of Psalms, and I read just a few, I'm just going to read a few promises of the fear of the Lord. Just listen to these, and I'll just read the Psalm. I won't read the verses for time's sake. Psalm 15, God honors the one who fears him. Psalm 25, who is the one who fears the Lord? God instructs him in the way chosen for him. That person who fears the Lord will spend his days in prosperity. It's amazing how many times financial prosperity is connected to the fear of the Lord. His children will inherit the land. The Lord confides or reveals his secrets to those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. This is his covenant. He makes the word of God, reveals it to those who fear him. His eyes are ever on those who fear him, and he releases their feet from that snare, just like that, that wolf that's caught in the snare. Psalm 31 Abundant good things are stored up for those who fear God. Psalm 33, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. He delivers them from death. From death, he keeps them alive in famine. Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from my fears. And because I look to him, I'm radiant. My face is not covered with shame. I was poor and the Lord heard me and saved me out of my poverty and my troubles. And I love this. The angel of the Lord encamps around the one who fears him, and he delivers them. You don't just have an angel to sit there watching you. He delivers you in your situation, whatever it is. Taste and see the Lord is good. Those who fear him lack nothing. Psalm 60. The Lord raises a banner for those who fear him. And that, that term banner, I'd look that up because I didn't quite understand it, but it, it's not just like a flag so that you're united, like you see a United States flag, you say, oh, I'm a citizen of that country. That's my country. And you have a sense of uni I'm united with all the other Americans. It's yes, you're, in the, you're a citizen of heaven, so you're now part of this, but it also is unfurled against the enemy. So it's, it's protection. It's a sign of protection. He raises a banner of protection. Psalm 67, for those who fear God, he, he gives them an abundant harvest. Psalm 85, his salvation is no, near to those who fear him. Psalm 103, as high as the universe is above this earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And he removes their transgressions as far as the east is from the west. The Lord's love is with those who fear him. Psalm 111, he provides food for those who fear him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Psalm 112, Psalm 112 is, a, is a, just a magnificent psalm to study on this subject. Blessed are those who fear the Lord. Their children are mighty in the land. Wealth and riches are in their house. Their name endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. I love that. They will never be shaken. They'll be remembered forever. They have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are secure. They have no fear. And in the end, they'll look in triumph on their enemies. Psalm 115. You who fear the Lord, he is your help and your shield. He blesses those who fear him. Psalm 128 this is another one I love. I read this every morning. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You eat the fruit of your labor. Have you ever worked really hard at something and not made enough money? 
Yet here it's the promise that if you fear the Lord, you'll eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity are yours. Your wife is like a fruitful vine within your house and your children are like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this is the blessing of the man who fears the Lord. Psalm 145, the Lord is near to those who call on him and he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. I skipped over Psalm 119, which has myriad of verses about that. Psalm 147, the Lord delights in those who fear him. And then there's many, many Proverbs that talk about this, also the blessings. Now, just a recap, just listen to these, these promises from God for those who fear him. For the one who fears him, he honors them. He gives them guidance. He prospers them. He gives them the inheritance of the land. He shares his secrets. He confides in them. He opens his word to them. His eyes are on them. He gives them abundance. He gives them good things. His eyes are on them. His unfailing love is to them. He gives them food and famine. He delivers them from fear. He delivers them from poverty. His angel encamps around you to rescue you. He gives you a banner of protection and and citizenship. He gives you a harvest. He gives you salvation. He gives you great love. He removes your sins. He provides food. He gives you wisdom. He gives you understanding. He blesses your children. He gives you wealth. He gives you riches. He gives your name to be, he makes your name remembered. He gives you light in dark times. He gives you food during the famine. He gives you no fear. He helps you. He protects you. He gives you a spacious place. He removes shame from you. He removes disgrace from you. He fulfills his promise to you. He gives you friendship with himself. He gives you friendship with other believers. He gives you joy. He lets you eat the fruit of your labor. He fulfills your desires. He saves you. He rescues you. He gives you his unfailing love. He gives you his knowledge, his instruction, his wisdom. He gives you long life. He gives you contentment. I mean, you think, you read that list and you go, well, why wouldn't you fear the Lord? This is so, it's so great. All these promises and blessings. There's a a great line in Isaiah 33 where he says, there's a treasure chest and it is filled with salvation and wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And there is a key to open that treasure chest. And the key is the fear of the Lord. There's a, a great promise earlier in Isaiah chapter 11, where he's describing the sevenfold spirit of God or the sevenfold ministry of Jesus, the the coming Messiah. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is on him and a spirit of comfort and understanding and and so forth and the power of the Lord. And then the last one, it says, and Jesus will delight in the fear of the Lord. He delights in the fear of the Lord. I love that. So why don't people fear the Lord? Why don't we fear the Lord? If all these promises are ours, I think some of it is a misunderstanding that that our sins separate us and we are used to shame and we don't understand the the gospel of our salvation. But I think in terms of the society at large, I think God's patience is actually one of the reasons why we don't fear the Lord. In Psalm 50, God says, because I was silent, you thought I was like you. I love that. Or some translations say, because I was silent, you thought I was altogether like you. Because people look and they see, well, you know, Stalin died in his sleep and Mao died in his sleep, so they got away with it. But nobody gets away with anything. I can guarantee you Joseph Stalin is not asleep and Mao is not asleep. You know, it just came out recently that Mao, just in the last few years, the Chinese government released some new information. We knew that Mao had killed more people than any other human being, but it just came out between 1958 and 1962, so a four-year period, he killed 45 million people in that period. I did the math on that. That's like 31,000 people a day. One guy killed them. Now, that guy's not sleeping, I guarantee you. Nobody gets away with anything. But because God restrains his judgment, and Peter says in in 2 Peter, he says, the Lord's patience means salvation. He's wanting people to be saved, so he's patient. He's not bringing the judgment yet. And I'm grateful he did, because if he had brought the judgment before I was born, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have experienced this. And that's why he's withholding his judgment. He's withholding for salvation. He wants everyone to be saved. He wants everyone to come to salvation. But that judgment is coming, and it will come soon. I think a second reason why is, and this is really where the revival in America will not happen until this is corrected. I think in the church we have what, for lack of a better term, I'll call it the Oprahization of Christian theology. And not to pick on Oprah, but because she's not a Christian minister, she's not proclaiming the name of Jesus, but her theology has definitely seeped over into the church. And it's the theology of grace is permission to sin. Grace means you can do whatever you want to do. And I think that's really the cancer in the church uh, right now. It's what Jude warns us about. The book of Jude is is really marvelous about that. I think another problem is we have a lot of self-righteous Christians. I've always thought that was baffling because our message is Christ's righteousness. So, you know, I always wonder, why do we have self-righteous Christians? The, the very message that I'm preaching is I have no righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. But because 
we want to be holy. I think some Christians get puffed up and they think that they're righteous. I think that's the, the beginning of this uh, Luke chapter 12 that he's talking about. I also think there's in the church a, a very distorted understanding of the sovereignty of God. I think sometimes people proclaim uh, the sovereignty of God to mean that God, uh, everything that happens, happens for a reason kind of thing, or God is in control. Well, the scripture actually says that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And Paul says the God of this world, small g, has blinded the eyes of non-believers so they can't see the glory of God and be saved. So I think we have to be careful when we say God is in control. There are a lot of things that happen that have not the will of God. And, you know, when Paul says in Ephesians, God is going to conform everything to the purpose of his will. The key verb there is conform. Well, conform, if it means anything, it means change, which means that what's happening is not the will of God, but he's going to make it the will of God. He's going to bring the kingdom, and he's going to wipe out the wicked in that. Um, just one quick footnote, and I kind of wish I didn't have to mention this, but I have a lot of friends who are uh, drawn toward this new, it's not a new theology, but they claim it's a new theology, and it's called annihilationism, and it's basically the teaching that there is no hell, and this is becoming actually increasingly popular. It's actually very old. This is an old heresy, but um, the problem I have with, and they base this on their interpretation of the word apollyon, which is the Greek word for destruction, because there are a lot of scriptures that say God will destroy the wicked, and I wish that were the case. I wish that they just ceased to exist. The problem I have with that is all of the descriptions of hell, most of them in the Bible, if you put the whole Bible up on the wall like a map and you were to put flag pins at any mention of hell, almost all of them are in the Gospels. Jesus is the one who talks about it more than anybody else. The apostles barely talk about it. Jesus is the one who mentions it. And he describes it always in terms of consciousness. He says it was not created for man, it was created for the devil. But people follow the devil and then go there with him. He says, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, if you cease to exist, you don't weep and gnash your teeth. He says, you will see the subjects of the kingdom of God, but you yourself will be shut out. Well, that obviously, if, you're not, if you don't exist, that can't be true. He has parables like the parable of the virgins where they pound on the door and he says, I don't know you. Parable of the sheep and the goats that I just alluded to. Um, and then, you know, even in this Luke 12, later he says... Those who know right from wrong but do wrong will be beaten with many blows. Those who don't know the law, don't know right and wrong but do wrong, will be beaten with few blows. So he gives us, he says there's going to be a distinction in punishment. Well, I don't even know what that means. I'm terrified to know what that means. But obviously, if you cease to exist, that can't be true. He said it'd be better if you cause a child, if you abuse a child, you're better off having a millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the ocean. Well, if you cease to exist, then that wouldn't be true either. And he the biggest one, he says, all the blasphemies against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. You're guilty of an eternal sin. But if you cease to exist, that wouldn't be true either. So I, I really reject this teaching of annihilationism. And, and there's more to that, but I don't want to keep going on that. Um, so lastly, how do we fear the Lord? What does this look like in everyday life? Because I think that's the most important thing. Um, David says, come, my children, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. He says, if you love life and you desire to see many good days, and I think that's a, that's a big if. You know, God says, I put before you life and death. Choose life. And yet Jesus said the majority will choose destruction. I don't know why per se, but I, I know that, that the Lord saved me. I, I was one who chose death. I was one who was always in despair. It's funny that I began by saying an I'm an optimist because I used to be such a pessimist and so suicidal. But God rescued me and God saved me and, and gave me that hope and that joy and that optimism through the fear of the Lord. And uh, here's an example of what the fear of the Lord looks like on an everyday basis. My friend, S.A., is an accountant, and she was working with a team of accountants on a big project. And she knew this was an important project and might lead to a promotion. And there was somebody else on that project who was vying for her for that promotion and competing with her and really going after her. And she was starting to really get anxious and upset about this. She went to the Lord in prayer and the Lord said to her essay, you have an audience of one, just focus on me. So she said, okay. And she repented of being worried about her, that person. And she just focused on the Lord, did the best she could. And in the end, she got the promotion. The other person was exposed. Now you may say, well, I did that, but uh, I didn't get the promotion doesn't matter. As Jack Hayford used to say, payday isn't always Friday. 
The Lord knows. The Lord sees. He will reward you. That time is coming. It may be a while down the road, but you can trust in that. Um, another story that I'll close with is my friend Wook, uh, who's Korean, he translated this account from a Korean newspaper. So I don't have the original source. Uh, but it was about the death of Jean-Paul Sartre. And if you know anything about existentialism, Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre were probably the two most uh, well-known proponents of, of existentialism. Existentialism basically is the belief that you cease to exist after death and that there is no heaven, there is no hell. And before I was a Christian, I have to say that was the most appealing philosophy of all to me, and I gravitated toward it. I read all their books and plays, and I love their stuff. After I became a Christian and realized that Jesus rose from the dead, it no longer held that allure for me, and I realized how false it was. And John Paul Sartre was, was quite the womanizer, and he was quite the drinker, and was very, very popular. And, uh, but he was dying, and he was in a hospital. And in the weeks just before his death, he started to become terrified. And he started to lash out and scream and curse and swear and throw fits. And uh, if you look, you know, on accounts about his death, they'll say, well, it was the alcohol or it was some uh, physical problem. But the truth of the matter is he was suddenly realizing that he was about to face the judge. And he was terrified. And he went, died kicking and screaming in horror. And, and it really is terrifying. The article then went on to contrast that with uh, Peter Marshall, who was uh, a well-known pastor in New England, and I think he was the chapel in Senate for a while. And when he died, he, he just looked at his wife, smiled, and said, I'll see you in a few, few days. And he closed his eyes and died in peace. One of my favorite deathbed stories of Christians is that of Augustine. And I mentioned earlier studying church history. If you had to put just a handful of people in a room who changed church history forever, Augustine would be one of them, good and bad. And that's true of every, everybody's got feet of clay in church history. But Augustine was a wild man himself in his youth. He was a womanizer and a drinker and a thief. And he came to the Lord late, later in life. And then he became the overseer or bishop of the area where he was from, uh, Algeria and North Africa, along the Mediterranean there. And he wrote and wrote and wrote. Augustine wrote so many books that one scholar said that it would be the equivalent of writing a, a 300-page book once a year, every year for 40 years. Another Catholic scholar said that anybody who's ever read everything that Augustine wrote is lying. He just wrote so much. But his books are still bestsellers. Confessions is a great book, uh, The City of God. But as he was dying, he asked that certain psalms be written out on paper and tacked up on the wall over his bed so he could read them. And while he was there, the barbarians were actually burning the city. On the other side, they could hear them. They were burning churches, the vandals. And uh, at one point, a man came in who was dying of cancer, and he said, asked Augustine to pray for him. And Augustine said, well, if I could heal you, I'd heal myself. And the man said, no, I was praying, and I had a vision, and the Lord told me, go to Augustine, and he'll, he'll lay his hand on you and heal you. So Augustine said, okay. So he put his hand on the man, prayed for him, and the man was instantly healed and got up and left. So Augustine was kind of going in and out of consciousness. And at one point, he ceased to breathe. And everybody gathered close to the, to the deathbed, and they leaned forward. And suddenly, he stirred. And he opened his eyes very wide and very animated. And he said, I've seen Jesus. I've seen the Lord Jesus. I've seen the Lord Jesus. And everything I wrote is straw. And then he died. And I love that story. And one of the Psalms that I particularly love is Psalm 130. And it says, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, nobody could stand. But with you, there's forgiveness. And therefore, you are feared. We fear the Lord because he loves us so much. Our fear of the Lord makes us the boldest of all people. Our nation is in trouble right now. It needs the church. But it needs the church to be revived. And the revival will come through a fresh understanding of the fear of the Lord, which makes us bold, bold as hell, humble before God, bolder than hell, so we can attack the spirit of darkness in our age. Derek Prince, one of my heroes in the faith, used to say, a Christian's job is to administer to the devil Christ's victory over him. And I agree with that. That's marvelous. A Christian's job is to administer to the devil Christ's victory over him. 
We are not to cower and be afraid of our culture as it's falling apart. The wheels are coming off the cart all around us. What is evil is called good. What is good is called evil. If, you know, the scripture says that science is the first revelation. We have people denying science all over the place. We have to just ignore that and be bold before the, before the Lord. Fear the Lord and be bold. Be unafraid because the Lord wants us to live a life absent of fear. Perfect love drives out fear.